you wanted the best, you've got the best podcast. The hottest, hottest. podcast in the, world. in the world. The Chris Voss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. The CEOs, authors, thought leaders, visionaries, and motivators. Get ready, get ready. Strap yourself in. Keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times. Because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host, Chris Voss. Hi, this is Voss here from thechrisvossshow.com. Thechrisvossshow.com. Welcome to the big show, my family and friends. We certainly appreciate you guys always tuning in and coming by. Uh, we've got amazing things going on here at the Chris Voss Show. We just recently launched... Uh, uh, AI with Chris Voss, uh, AI podcast with Chris Voss at AIChrisVoss.com. It's our new AI podcast. Uh, there's, we're reporting a lot of the interviews we do on the Chris Voss show for automated, or not automated intelligence, artificial intelligence. That is automated, actually. Uh, and uh, that's over there as well. The Chris Voss Leadership Podcast is now up at ChrisVossInstitute.com. Check that out as well. For the show, your family, friends, and relatives. We have a returning amazing guest and author to the show, uh, Tom Clavin is on the show. Tom, did I get that right? Yes, you did. Thank you. There I go. There's so much interview you put in the front of the show. Something the brain goes woohoo right out the door. Everyone knows that. Everyone's seen that movie for 14 years. Uh, so Tom Clavin is on the show, returning as a wonderful guest. He has written his newest book that just came out April 4th, 2023. Follow me to hell. McNelly's Texas Rangers and the Rise of Frontier Justice. Follow Me to Hell is actually my biography. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so you can order where fine books are sold. Tom is on the show with us today. His most recent work uh, is the one I just aforementioned. It's a, he's a best-selling author. He's worked as a newspaper and website editor, magazine writer, TV and radio commentator, and a reporter for the New York Times covering entertainment, sports, and the environment. He's received awards from the Society of Professional Journalists, Marine Corps Heritage Foundation, and National Newspaper Association. Four of his books have become New York Times bestsellers, and uh, his other books have received popular and critical acclaim and all that good stuff. Welcome to the show, Tom. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you for having me back. Thank you for coming back. It's good to see you again. We love our returning guests. I think if they come back off enough, they get one of those SNL robes. But we haven't gotten SNL to ship them to us. So, you know, Saturday Night Live does that robe thing. Anyway, uh, give us your dot coms, Tom, wherever you want people to follow you on the interwebs. Well, I have a very clever address. It's Tom Clavin, T O M C L A V I N dot com. Tom Clavin dot com. Has my books, uh, has appearances for a book tour that I just completed. So it's probably obsolete information I should take down has a bit of a biography, has contact information. I, I really do hear on a daily basis from readers, and I reply. So if anybody finds out my, my email address from my website and contacts me, they'll get a reply. There you go. And uh, you, you write a lot about, uh, well, which, which, is it appropriate to call it the Wild West? It is, the, the Wild West. And uh, it's interesting about the Wild West because our, I think our perception from all the TV shows and movies is the Wild West lasted about 100 years. <laughs> and it really, didn't, you think that way, you know, I mean, to yeah. pack all those characters and action and, and, and events. But for the most part, the Wild West began after the Civil War ended, and by by really the the early 1880s, the Wild West was becoming less wild. I mean, we just had more civilizations spreading west. And mm -hmm. uh, but during that that 17 or 18 year period, it was pretty wild, and there were a lot of very colorful characters, and it never seems to be a lack of people to write about. I thought I thought Wild West uh, lasted for only ten or twenty years in the '60s with John Wayne and uh, and uh, you know Clint Eastwood. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, you know he did he did a couple movies about westerns. Um, so t tell us about this new story. Why did you decide to pick the story of the Texas Rangers? I was I sort of stumbled upon it, which is mostly the way that I find ideas. Uh, I was work. It was it was a few years ago. I was working on my book called Wild Bill about uh, Wild Bill Hickok, and mm -hmm. one of the uh, significant, not major characters, but significant characters in the Wild Bill stories, a fellow named John Wesley Harden, who was one of the most prolific man killers and gunslingers of of the Wild West. And it mentioned he and Wild Bill have kind of a confrontation confrontation in Abilene, Kansas. And then he leaves and goes on to other adventures. And one of the, I was doing some research, and one writer had put the beginning of the end for for uh, Harden was when he was chased out of Texas by Leander McNelly of the Texas Rangers. Hmm. So 
But I sort of filed that away because I said he was a pretty hard case, this guy, John Wesley Harden. What was it about McNelly that made him so imposing that he could chase John Wesley Harding out of his native Texas? Mm. And so uh, I sort of filed that away. And then I was stumbled across something else, which is that in 2023, this year that we're in, last I looked anyway, uh, is the bicentennial of the Texas Rangers. Mm. They, were, they were founded in August 1823. And I thought, wow, that's an amazing accomplishment or achievement that you can have a law enforcement organization that's 200 years old, I mean, 100 years old in the FBI. Mm. And I sort of put the two and two together and said, I'd love to write something about the Texas Rangers for the bicentennial. Well, let me check out this guy, McNelly. Uh, and, and the more I found out about him and about his adventures, in the, mostly in the 1870s, the more I thought this would be a good story because you have this uncommon combination of somebody who really played an important role in the, in the American West or as far west as Texas is, and yet most people don't know about some of his amazing adventures, which is good for a writer because you think I can tell a good story and not be telling the same story about the same character. How many books can you write about Billy the Kid, for example? But That's here's true. Somebody, here's somebody different. Yeah. So uh, tell us about McNally. What, who was this guy and how did he end up forming the Texas Rangers? He was a, uh, uh, he was a native of Virginia. Uh, he had suffered from what they called in those days consumption. So at a young age, his family moved to Texas thought the climate might help him. And so he grew, spent his teenage years in Texas. He was joined the Civil War when he was 17 years old. As soon as it broke out, he served with the Confederate Army. Uh, after two years, he was still, I think, I don't even think he was 20 yet. He was a captain of, of a, a ranger, uh, a, a, a Confederate uh, roaming uh, scouting company. Uh, had a very successful Civil War career, meaning that he survived <laughs> and, and had a bunch of adventures that, that are detailed in the book. And then after... Um, the Civil War, his main intention was to go back to Washington County, Texas, be a farmer. He got married, had a couple of kids. But the Texas Rangers had, were being reformed after the Civil War. And um, the Texas government was taking the bold step of actually coming up with a budget to pay these people to, to provide law enforcement. And they reached out to some Civil War veterans and said, we need young captains. Mm -hmm. And Leander McNelly uh, said, sign me up. And uh, for the next several years, he was the leader of a, a company of Texas Rangers that uh, he wasn't a, a captain for more than just a few years because his consumption got the better of him. But during that time, uh, they confronted John Wesley Harden. They, they, they stopped a war in a county, a Hatfield, the McCoy kind of war in one of the counties in Texas. Uh, they invaded Mexico uh, and almost started with the second Mexican-American war. Uh, they, uh, they just had a lot of adventures, a lot of running around, a lot of border patrol, a lot of fights, a lot of conflicts. And so it sounds like uh, with Lee McNelly as the captain, and, and the title comes from something he told his men when they were about to invade Mexico. He said, I might lead you into hell, but I'll lead you back out again if you follow me. They were fiercely loyal to him. He, he, he was a very, uh, partly because of his frailty. Mm -hmm. the, 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 what it took for him to go on a horse every day and chase bad guys inspired them to say, if he can do it, we can do it. Wow. So uh, with, were they originally ordained official uh lawmen or did they start as kind of a uh kind of a local band of guys who were trying to just uh you know enforce uh, you know cattle rustlers and and all sorts of illegal activities you know that's a really good question because it, what what that what that question covers not just leander mcnelly's company but it, it, it covers the entire texas rangers because mm -hmm. early in their history they were basically, you know, they weren't sheriffs. They weren't marshals. They were, you know, they, they, they weren't sworn in deputies. They were sort of like Minutemen, like in Lexington and Concord days where, uh oh, the British are coming. Let's get, grab you, grab a gun, grab a powder horn, and gra grab a horse if you have one, whatever you can bring and, and meet here because then we'll band together and we'll react to the crisis. And yeah. That was yeah. just the strangest formula for decades, you know, especially be, you know, before the Civil War. Okay, there's been an invasion. Mexico's invaded. Let's get together and 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 fight the Mexicans and send them back across the Rio Grande. Or the the Comanches have just invaded. You know, crossed over the the our western border. Let's get a bunch of guys together with their guns and their horses, and we'll chase them back across into, into maybe all the way to New Mexico. So that was that was the way the Texas Rangers operated, and and McNelly was one of those transformative Ranger captains after the Civil War because. Yes, the Texas government was deciding to actually set up a budget to pay Texas Rangers to be law enforcement officers, which had not really been the case before. Mm. And McNelly was one of those rare 
early officers in the Texas Rangers who he, he treated his his company like a law enforcement company. He had he trained them. He made sure they could shoot well, that they could ride well, that they would listen to orders, that they were training, that they knew, knew how to do scouting. They even did things like planted informers, uh, informants, uh, wow. and, and rival and rival gangs. Wow. Um, and so they were kind of like the 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 very first glimmer of what is the modern Texas Rangers was really during the McNally years in the early to mid 1870s. Wow. It sounds like, uh, who's the guy who started the FBI? Uh, David back Hoover. In? Well, Hoover. And then, uh, Oh, well, who, who's the guy before that? That, uh, uh, Nels, Nelly. There was, uh, well, there's Eli Elliot Ness. Elliot Ness. There Elliot you. Ness was with, uh, he was with the, Oh gosh. I think he was FBI. He was also at one point, he was the chief of police of Cleveland where some of his adventures took yeah. place. Too. Most people that that wasn't on the TV show. Cleveland didn't sell ratings. Yeah, I think he didn't. He start like uh, you know laying a foundation for like I think didn't he start fingerprints and uh, things like that. So this is this is kind of interesting. Was one of the was 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 one of the problems that Texas couldn't afford or were they able to pay them to do this? And I know Texas is huge in size, so trying to regulate. Of course, back then was it partially Mexico? I mean, it, well, yeah, until it was it was Spanish. Uh, it was all part of Spain's holdings in mm. the, North America. Then when Mexico won its independence from Spain in 1821, it was Texas was all part of Me Mexican holdings, which stretched from the border of Louisiana all the way to California. Mm -hmm. And so uh, once Texas became its own republic, uh, which was after 1836, you know, the Alamo, the Battle of San Jacinto, when they became their own republic, uh, one of the things that they really plagued them for years, they had no money, you know, I mean, Texas remains to this day one of those states that's not very fond of taxation. Mm -hmm. So, so when I don't we, know, I've seen people's property taxes down there. <laughs> <laughs> but they, they, if you if you have a trouble raising money, uh, then you know you have diff different agencies and departments that get the short end of the stick. And for for decades, literally decades, the Texas Rangers mm -hmm. almost had to. I mean, if you were a Texas Ranger, you were hired as a Texas Ranger. You had to bring part of your contract, so to speak, was you had to bring your own horse and your own gun and your own food. Wow! So all they, all they provided you was ammunition. Did you get free coffee? No, I'm free just coffee, yeah, yeah. It free coffee decaf. and beans. Decaf, though. So free free coffee and beans. That sounds like a Mel Gibson movie. That one. Or Mel Brooks. <laughs> Mel Brooks. Yeah. Thanks for correcting me there. It's Monday. I'm half asleep. Um. So uh. Yeah. <laughs> it was the beans and. And farting uh, a bit that they did. Very funny, sitting around the campfire there. Um, so uh, they do this. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, uh, the tease out that uh, he ran uh, the dude out of uh, Texas. Do you want to tease out any on that? Yeah. Uh, one of the adventures that McNally's Rangers had is there was, a, there was a, a county, a DeWitt County in Texas, had these two families, the Sutton family and the Taylor family. Mm. And they had this long feud that began – before and then during and then after the Civil War, where these family members were constantly battling each other, fighting, shooting each other, they, you know, they're dropping like flies on either side. And if they just wanted to kill each other, that was sort of like okay, because eventually mm -hmm. they were done left. So mm -hmm. let them kill themselves out of existence. But a lot of people were getting caught in the crossfire. Mm -hmm. so finally, uh, the Texas government, the governor sends McNally and his rangers into DeWitt County and says, you got to calm these people down. It really was, it made the Hatfields and McCoys look like a skit out of Sesame, Sesame Street. Yeah. These two Sutton and Taylor families hated the, the heck out of each other. So McNally's rangers went in there and they started to basically confront, intimidate, or in turn shoot members of the families and say, you got to, you know, if you can't stop yourselves, we're going to stop you. Wow. A in law of the Taylor family was John Wesley Harden. And John Wesley Harden was, you know, more of a bad guy than, say, a Billy the Kid or a Jesse James. I mean, this was somebody who killed because he enjoyed it and because mm. he kept getting away with it. Sounds like a guy I know. No, I'm just yeah. kidding. That's yeah. Not me. This is pre-tattoos. Pre pre yeah. Uh, and so, I, as far as I know, maybe, or maybe he was branded. I don't know. That was, that's a, that was the tattoo in Texas in the 1850s and 60s. And oh, really? You got branded. Yeah. So... Um, so McNelly said, I, I, I got the way to calm down this whole situation is I've got to track down and arrest or kill John Wesley Harden. Now, Harden was a tough guy, but mm -hmm. by this point, McNelly had such a reputation as a completely fearless, 
and always coming out on top whatever conflict he was in and Harden said you know what I think it's time to leave Texas and he literally before McNelly could catch up with him he left Texas went to Florida where the Texas Rangers eventually tracked him down and arrested him and put him in jail for the next one. Wow. Years. So they had jurisdiction to, to cross over? Or is it well, kind of how the Wild West worked? Sort of what right? happened was that, uh, <laughs> sort of what happened is, is one of McNally's lieutenants uh, tracked uh, uh, Harden to Florida. Wow. And they got, and he, when, when they found out that, that uh, Harden was on his train that was coming into a station, I think it was Tallahassee or Pensacola, something like that, mm -hmm. the, the lieutenant, knowing he did not have jurisdiction, mm -hmm. hired a local deputy local Florida deputy and said, okay, we're both going to go on and get on this train. Here's the guy we're going to arrest. I can't arrest him. You can arrest him. But once you arrest him, mm -hmm. I can become sort of like the transportation manager. Oh. You can, you can, you can give me a voucher for train fare mm -hmm. that will return Harden to where he's wanted in Texas. And that's basically how it worked out. The early days uh, of extradition. There was a brief shootout. Harden was arrested and then he was turned over to the Texas Ranger. Oh. And his name I think was Armstrong, if I remember correctly. And Armstrong cuffed him, put him on a train, took him back to Texas where he stood trial. There you go. Did he get to stop by Disney while he was there? No, I'm <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> you know, you really got to hate a guy to go all the way to Florida and fight alligators to and and flies and everything else that's down there, humidity. Uh, it, you really got to you really got to hate a guy to go there. No, but that's that's good. This is these is the early this is early standards of, of building this. Why do you find and why do you think your audience uh and hopefully we pick up some new people for your audience. Um why do you why do you think people uh find an affinity for this uh, era of time and these historical uh, Well, I think part of it is demographics in that if you have a demographic like mine, I'm of a generation that's say 50 or 55 and older where uh, when you were a kid, uh, it was commonplace on television to find Westerns. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. You can still find the occasional Western double feature at the lo local theater. Mm -hmm. uh, they were still making Westerns, even though the, the era of people like James Stewart and John Wayne were declining, you know, in, in the late sixties, certainly into the seventies. So a lot of those, those cowboys, so so-called cowboy stars were, would, retiring or dying off Glenn Ford, some of these others. And then, so, so I think that there's an affinity for Western American West stories because it, it sort of like makes you connect a bit to your childhood where, where you where it was not uncommon to turn on the television and you found Rawhide and Bonanza and have gun will travel the big Valley and, stor and, and stories like that. Mm -hmm. I think another part of it is that there's also a generation or two, which knows that the so-called wild West existed, but doesn't know, really that much about it. I mean, they recognize a name like Wild Bill Hickok or Jesse James mm -hmm. um, and uh, and Bat Masterson and, and Wyatt Earp, of course. But they might be curious, well, what, what do these guys really do that makes them a memorable, that made them these iconic characters that we still name, have name recognition in 2023? So I think there's, there's an audience out there for that. And then I think there's an audience that, since this is not my first book, I've written a bunch of books, after a while, if you you either catch an audience mm -hmm. and they want to follow you and they want to read your next book, or you've turned to do something else like you're you're in sanitation or you're in uh, your your short order cook because you couldn't make it as a writer, mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and which has got to be very frustrating. Thankfully, since I can't cook, uh, I've managed to continue as a writer. There you go. Well, that's good. That's good. Well, I think a lot of people are going to love this. We've had a number of authors that have written about Texas on the story. Uh, about you know all sorts of different stories about Texas, and uh, man, they light they love to light up uh, the YouTube video comments. Uh, no matter what it is, especially anybody who, who talks about uh, you know some some of the uh, checkered history of Texas, uh, and maybe some of the issues of racism. Boy, they they really go after those videos. <laughs> Uh, so I know that it's popular uh, to talk about Texas. And there's a lot of people. I mean, what is Texas the second or third most uh, populous state, or is that New York? Uh, I know there's a lot of people in Texas. Let's put it that way, and they're very, they're very adamant about their independence and stuff. So this is a good story, and uh, the foundings of the thing. Um, I, I suppose it, you know they, they tease in the book that uh, uh, it's a courageous yet doomed captain and his team of fearless men. Do you want to tease anything out about that, or should we force people to write the book to find out what happens? Well, you know, I, I mentioned before Leander McNally had consumption and. Uh, you know, there was no cure, 
certainly not in the 1870s for consumption. The, your best hope is that you can find a, a somewhat healthy climate, uh, yeah. and Texas offered that to some extent. I mean, certainly better than Connecticut or, or Virginia, where McNally was originally from. But it was only a matter of time. And also in, in McNally's pl uh, case, he was not one to sit around in his rocking chair and take care of himself. He was out there having these adventures. He was chasing yeah. the bad guys with his company of men. He was, they were camping out every night in all kinds of weather. I mean, mm -hmm. yes, in Texas, you're not going to get that too, too much in the way of snowstorms or ice storms. But still, you have, can have some, some degrees of weather change. And if you're camping out, it's a rainy night. It's a rainy night. And you're camping out. You're cold. And you've got consumption. So um, that's why uh, McNelly you could be, in a way, can be considered doomed because uh, he, he, he knew he wasn't going to have a long lifespan to begin with, and he didn't do much to help himself along, to have a long lifespan. Mm -hmm. And um, I think, you know, to explain part of that, I think it was because he knew that he had a disease that was ultimately going to be fatal. And his, his thinking was, if I'm going to die and going to die young, mm -hmm. relatively young, I'd rather do it while I'm on a horse chasing a bad guy than do it lying in bed. So, mm -hmm. so I think, so. I, I, that, you know, that's, <coughs> excuse me, one of the reasons for his fearlessness is that uh, he he literally did not fear death because it well, wasn't liberal to what to, to the uh, option. There you go. Well, you know, it's better to go out with a bang than to uh, what is that old line? Uh, do not go gently into that good night. Uh, it's I'm a Neil Young that. line. Better better to burn out than it is to rust. <laughs> yeah. Or is it uh, uh, the Who? I hope I die young before I get old. Something, hope I, I die know. before I get old. Yeah. Which is funny because I think Roger. Daltrey's like 80 or something now. <laughs> no, so he didn't listen to himself. Yeah, well, he tried. Uh, Bonham got there. Um, and so did Keith Moon. Um, that was that was uh, dark and too soon. Uh, but anyway, they were both wonderful drummers. Um, and it, anyway, uh, so this has been really insightful. I think people will love it. And uh, as you mentioned, it's a bicentennial. I mean, it, this is the founding of 200 years of uh, organization that uh, does law enforcement. And uh, a great job of it. And uh, all that good stuff. Uh, so give us your dot coms, Tom, uh, so you can find you on the interwebs, please. It is Tom Clavin, T O M C L A V, as in Victor I N, dot com. And I'll find some other books there too, because some people might or might not be familiar with the previous books like Dodge City and Tombstone and Wild Bill. And nothing has to be read in order, but uh, I, I, think, I think people enjoy the books. I think another thing about it that uh, you asked before about uh, an affinity for it is uh, this book also, I try and inject some kind of and humor also mm -hmm. i mean no, nobody should read my book thinking that it's it's humorless and they got to take things terribly seriously there's some serious stuff in there but you know i just i just was doing a, a book i'm working on now there's there's a piece in there about a, a outlaw who was killed in 18 eight, like 1890 and he wasn't buried until the mid to late 1970s oh and what happened well his body was used as a carnival show attraction for decades and then it was, they lost it in some kind of warehouse for, for another few more decades. And it was found by a crew, a production crew for the TV show Million Dollar Man with Ooh. Lee Majors in the 1970s when they were unpacking some crates in this warehouse. And, and so the TV crew found this mummified body. So they eventually buried this guy in 1977. An outlaw had been killed in the 1890s. Now, that's funny. Yeah, it, it is it is an interesting story. I think I know who you're talking about. The, they took her the the head around the carnival show, didn't they? Was that the guy? I think they, uh, this particular guy, they took the whole body. Oh, did they? They dressed him up as an outlaw, even though he was they, kind of deteriorating over time. There you go. And then your Blood and Treasure book that we had you on prior, so we'll give a plug to that show, uh, is an editor's pick on uh, Amazon. So congratulations for that. Thank you. Yeah, that, that book, we, we were very, Bob Drury and I were very, pleasantly surprised because we i mean we knew he had an iconic character in daniel boone who had a lot of adventures in the 1800s 1790s 1780s but mm -hmm. that helped but we also didn't know is there still an audience for that and when the book came out it immediately went to the new york times bestseller list and stayed there for a few weeks it's been selling great in paperback mm -hmm. As i hear like i say i hear from readers uh, almost every day and still i hear a lot of people about blood and treasure it's just a fun book to read there you go. Uh, and a lot of great books you have. How many books do you have total? Well, I claim 18. Uh -huh. I, don't, I don't count them. Okay. And I worry, I worry, especially if they're more than 18, that I don't count them because every so often you have somebody give you that backhand compliment, the prolific Tom Clavin. <laughs> and you know what they're really saying is? Is it? 
if this guy writes th this many books, they can't be that good. Oh, wow. Wow. I never thought that was past. Right, so stop, Jack Benny stopped at 39. He never turned older than 39. I've never mm -hmm. written more than 18 books. We have people on the show that have written 60. No, I think we have somebody who's done 150. They can't be that good. Well, they're all novels. <laughs> oh, okay. That's different. Yeah. And, uh, you know, once you kind of have the blueprint, you, you, I mean, they're, they're, they're all good evidently and they have a popular falling, but, uh, um, you know, they've been writing all their life. They're old like us. <laughs> the, uh, and you've written a lot of great books. The, the outlaws about the Dalton gang. I'll give you a few plugs in your tombstone, uh, wild bill, Dodge city. You know, these are all movie things. Uh, one thing that was interesting here, the last man out, uh, the true story of America's, uh, heroic final hours of Vietnam. Wow. There you go. Yeah, there's efforts to develop that into a, a, a limited, what they call a limited series, mm -hmm. because uh, the, the, the production company is looking at, uh, they originally had it with the National Geographic Channel. Now I think it's someplace else. Because 1975, excuse me, 2025, April 2025, which is now less than two years away, is the 50th anniversary of the fall of Saigon. Wow. And, you know, the, our book, Last Man Out, which I did with Bob Drury, is about the when everybody abandoned the city on April 30th, 1975, we left 11 Marines on the roof of the American Embassy. Oh, and, and, wow. and that morning, as the sun rises, they're peering over from down from the roof as 150,000 North Vietnamese troops are entering Saigon. And so the book is about what, how, do they get out of there? How many get out of there? What happens? How do they get themselves out of there? And a lot of these guys, some of these guys are – I don't want to give too much away. Look, some of these guys are still alive, and wow. you know the the people, powers that be thought that that would make for a really exciting and gripping limited series to coincide with the 50th anniversary of the fall of Saigon. So we'll see what happens. Yeah, that will definitely be interesting. What a, har a harrowing story! I can't imagine being, you know, we just kind of saw some of that in Afghanistan. I think we. Yes. Have somebody writing a book on that that's been on the show um well thank you very much Tom, for coming on the show it was great to see you again wonderful to have you please come back and uh give us your uh you gave us your dot com so we've got that out of the way uh thanks man it's for tuning in uh order up the book wherever fine books are sold and stay away from those alleyway bookstores because they're dangerous you could get mugged uh follow me to hell McNelly's Texas Rangers and the Rise of Frontier Justice. Available where fine books are sold. Uh, damn, I'm going to have to find a new title for my memoir. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in to my audience. Go to goodreads.com, Fortress Chris Voss, YouTube.com, Fortress Chris Voss, and uh, LinkedIn, Fortress Chris Voss, all the crazy places on the internet. Thanks for tuning in. Be good to each other. Stay safe, and we'll see you guys next time.